Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mike Morris, and uh, we're going to go ahead and get started here. Uh, the young lady came in and told me twice to make sure I informed you. If you're here for credit to get your uh, CDs, then uh, you have to stay here the whole time, and she'll be here at the end of the hour to scan your badge. So I made my public service announcement for everybody. Uh, I see a lot of uniforms out there for all of you who are serving. Thank you for all of you who have served. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about today, about the answer response and uh, with AI. Now, who am I? Um, quick rundown. I, uh, I've had about, about 38 years in cybersecurity. Uh, 25 of those were with the FBI as a special agent, supervisory special agent, laboratory director, uh, dealing with um, uh, cyber crime investigations, uh, terrorism investigations, and counter counterintelligence investigations. Uh, I spent a lot of my time being the uh, the person in the bug truck who would go in and uh, you know you know be, be the plumber, the uh, painter, the whatever to get information needed for foreign counterintelligence cases. Um, I, my career progressed. I went into, uh, after I uh, retired out of the FBI, I went to work with Price Waterhouse as director of incident response. Did that for a couple of years. For all of you who are road warriors, God bless you. Uh, you know, it, it's really cool when you're in your 20s, you think, oh yeah, I'm going to play every week. And then you get your 50s and it's like, oh, I don't like being on a plane every week. <laughs> but, uh, after being road warrior for a couple of years, I went to work for Price Water, I went to work for one of my clients, uh, who is a uh, energy uh, Fortune 500. Um, at that time, they were, and I joined them in bankruptcy. And so, uh, the key there is make make sure if you ever join a company like that, get a golden parachute because uh, you never know. You roll the dice and you hope that you're going to come out as a winner. Um, I got a golden parachute. We did, so they still paid me a year severance package. So I came out and I was like, what do I want to do with the rest of my life? What do I want to do? And uh, I live in Dallas, and uh, most of the jobs at that time for CISOs were either north of Dallas, west of Dallas, by about an hour and a half from where I lived. And so I looked online and I found uh, Western Governors University, and I became an instructor at Western Governors University in the master's program. Uh, allowed me to work from home, I thought that was pretty cool. And uh, so then I did that for a couple of years and then became a program chair over program. It was like, well, I can either sit around and gripe about things or I can actually fix it. So stepped up and did that. And then uh, a couple of years went by and, and I became associate dean uh, at Western Governors University over all the cyber programs. This is my one and only ad for Western Governors and one will happily move on. Oh, the young lady is in the back. Did I mention everything? Did I get it right? Are we good? Okay. Good deal. Um, real quick about Western Governors. Um, we are a competency-based institution. We have, uh, you learn, you, you, you earn by actually doing it and not by time and seat. So if you come in day one and you pass a test, you move on to course number two. That's how that works. So any experience you've earned in the military or anyplace else, uh, it applies there. Our bachelor's program, I currently have about 21,000 students in it. Students earn a degree and earn 16 industry certifications when they walk out the door. By the time they walk out the door, they've earned them. Same thing in the master's program. They earn five industry certifications, including the CATS Plus or Security X and uh, the CISM. And uh, we have about 4,000 students in there. And then for the Navy, we have a program for E5s and below where they can earn a, an associate uh, degree. And so uh, those are our, the programs that we have. All right, on with the show. All right. so. Again, I'm going, to start, I'm going to start at the base level and we'll work our way up, okay? So, you know, back in my day when I, when I first uh, started doing everything in computers, we had punch cards and paper tape. That's how old I am. You know, then we moved to a client server model. You know, we had a server and you had the client machine. Then we moved to mobile, mobile and file. And now we have Edge. Everything is, everything is about data. Everything is sending data back. We've now learned how important data is. It's very distributed, it's across anywhere, depending on how your networks are. You know, it could be across multiple, you know, multiple states, multiple countries, and uh, it's a very large footprint. Again, these are all just refresher ones, and we'll get into the meat here in just a second. 
for cloud. You know, many of you serving in the military, just like when I was in the, in, in the FBI, we had, you had to pay on the classification of your system. Everything stayed within, you know, certain walls, or, or everything stayed within certain networks. Um, you know, so that's your on-prem. You know, as far as if you go to, you know, as a service, infrastructure for service, you know, they are basically, uh, you know, providing you the bare metal, and you provide everything else. As you move up the stack of easiness, if you will, and easiness of use, you know, then you have platform as a service, you know, where they're providing everything, but the uh, your application is going to run and your data. And then you have the whole Megillo, of what is known as software as a service, where, you know, the easy button. So they, they do everything for you. Now, we're going, well, why are we talking about cloud? Why are we talking about this? Because each, one, each time you get a level of easiness, you lose a level of self-control. You lose a level of ownership. You lose a level of where is my data? Where is, how is my stuff being acted on? And so that's where it becomes really important when you're dealing with like folks with like your vendor management people who are setting up contracts because your contract doesn't say, hey, if we have an incident, I get to come into your facility and get X, Y, or Z. Or within so many minutes, you're gonna provide me this kind of data. You know, so it's very important as we move along down to our train ride today. Now, this is a recent study that came out last week from Cato Security, talking about over two thirds of uh, customers, 65% of the organizations, take between three and five days longer to investigate incidents in the cloud. And it gets back to what I just mentioned to you. The easier it is to use the service, the harder it is to get it, find out what's going on. You know, and so it, 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 it's, a, it's a loop. You know, you trade, you know, like I said, it's a trade off. But if you use a lot of cloud in your organization, you probably are dealing with this. You've probably been burned once or twice, and you're like, oh, next time when we set up a contract, we're going to put this into the contract. So, cloud provides complexity. All right, I see a lot of federal people in this room, a lot of federal contractors. Who here knows FISBA? I see a couple of people nodding along. All the rest of you are like, oh, geez, what's he talking about FISBA for? Well, again, we're talking about incidents. So, when you talk about the definition of an incident, if you're on a federal system, you're talking FISBA in there, you know, and so you can read, I'm not going to read it to you, I've highlighted a couple words in there, you know, without lawful authority, violation of imminent threat or violation of law, security policies that affect, you know, our big three, integrity, confidentiality, and availability. For extra bonus points, how long do you have to report to Congress if you've had an incident under FISMA? Anybody? I feel like Bueller. Bueller? Bueller? Anyone? <laughs> You have seven days. That's report to not to your command, but to report to Congress. And I'm not a policy guy, but I thought that was interesting. I was like, oh, there you go. Now, I don't know how. I don't know what happens if you don't do that. I don't know how who comes by and smacks you with a stick on there, but uh, that's what that, that's what it says. All right. So let's talk about a little bit about incident response plans, um, and we're going to build upon this as well. So this is just basic incident response plans. Again, when you're talking to incident response plan, you're talking about just like you train for anything in the military. It is a plan. It is based on a series of facts. So you're, you're saying, okay, I have this set of circumstances, I have this set of assets, and if something bad were to happen, if bad thing number one happens, what are we going to do? Who are we going to contact? How's it going to happen? You know, this is kind of what we're talking about here, the components of it. What type of incident happened? You know, who's gonna deal with it? Now, it's not just the, the computer ninjas who are gonna deal with it, okay? For, you're gonna have media involved, you're gonna have you know, media representation involved, you know, to, to have you, if the media comes to the door. You're gonna have legal involved, you're gonna have, you know, um, all of your security uh, specialists involved. And so it's much better to have a plan and have it documented in there, who's gonna do what and how it's gonna happen and wait till the thing goes boom. So, you know, when you deal, when you have a plan, when you have an a, a incident response plan, it definitely reduces your downtime. It reduces your exposure, it reduces your media exposure. Um, 
it helps your your reg uh, your uh, record talk today. It helps what the you know, what the public thinks of you. Regulatory compliance. You know, in the energy sector, we had something uh, that went down. It was you know everybody was on top of you. Um, just like uh, and I'm not picking on anybody in here. If you're if you happen to own the company or anything, I'm not picking on anybody. But I will say that I was supposed to go to D.C. a couple of weeks ago on the weekend. And I go to get there, and the airline said, guess what you're not doing? You're not traveling. And I said, why is that? And they said, well, CrowdStrike took us down. And so then I didn't get on my Delta flight. So not picking on CrowdStrike, but I'm just saying, that's why you have an incident response plan. An incident doesn't have to be bad guys breaking to your shop. An incident can just be something bad happens to your company, something bad happens to your system, something bad happens to your customers on there. But it's really important to have one. Anybody here, and you don't have to say where, when, or what, but just raising your hands, how many people have actually been in a major incident? See a couple? It's not a fun experience. <laughs> <laughs> and after you have one, you will definitely want to have a plan and have it in place. Now this is just a, uh, you know, here's some, here's some resources in there. there. There are a ton of resources out, out there. I highlighted some. NIST, of course, has a bunch. Um, you know, you can find them through Google. You can find multiple templates depending on your, on your agency. You can find cloud. Cloud is a very specific type of incident response. And I say that because it gets back to the, the nuances within cloud and the type of cloud frameworks there are. And so if you deal with cloud, which most people probably do, if you deal with cloud, make sure you have a plan in place. Make sure you go through and you test it. Because you'll find out in a really hard way that what happens um, if you don't. All right, you've already been through a couple of presentations today, I'm sure, on AI. I saw one on uh, offensive and defensive uh, cyber warfare. I, thought that I didn't get a chance to go see it, but I, I saw it. I was oh, that was, that was really cool. But everybody and their brother now, every boss and their brother, says, oh, I've seen AI. I've seen you know, chat GPT. It can save us millions of dollars. It can make us millions of dollars. i got to have it. i got to have it. You know, and so... When your boss comes and he does say, you know, I want to have uh, AI inside our shop, there's some steps you need to go through. You know, as in all business cases, and I, when I say business, I don't mean outside civilians doing business. When I say business, whatever your business is. So if your business is, is protecting the country, you know, what's the business case for AI? Why do we need it? What is it going to do for us? How is it going to make us or save us money, save lives. You know, what is the reason why we have this thing? Um, be the voice of reason, because AI right now is like the magic unicorn. Oh, we gotta have this thing. So I'm just telling you, <laughs> you know, when you're talking to your leadership, you know, don't be afraid to ask, in a polite way, of course, the why. You know, what's it gonna do for us, boss? You know, then once you figure out what the true why is, what you're trying to accomplish there, you know, you've got to make sure you get a team together. And it's not just going to be, um, you know, it's not just going to be security folks in the room. It's not just going to be cloud engineering, you know, risk and audit teams. You're going to have privacy people in there. You're going to have legal people in there, data science teams, you know, development teams. And you're going to have ethics. You're going to have to have ethics in this thing. And we'll talk a little bit about this in just a minute for AI. Really important. All right, building blocks of AI. Um, and this is just a really high level. So we all know that data, talking AI, we're talking data and large amount of data. We have machine learning that goes on inside there. We then get a smaller set of and more detailed, more laser focused type of machine learning where we get into deep learning. We're doing that using neural networking. Neural networking leads us then into cognitive thinking, trying to get a computer to have singularity, you know, how to have that system where it's more like a human, like a human. You add in, you know, natural language abilities. I would like to have a picture of a dog running through some flowers. Okay? So it 
would understand what you just typed. We need the last part, computer vision. You need to teach it what is a dog, what is flowers, what does the, you know, the daytime look like. So this is a very basic um, learning box in there. And we're going to go down in a different path here in just a minute. Go to these, look at these in a different way. Now like any project, when you're working on developing AI, you're developing an AI system, it's just like you have, it's almost like the Udu loop, you know, that you have on any business project, on any, any kind of thing out there. You know, so you're gonna come up with a plan. Okay, we need, we gotta have it for the business reasons. Come up with a plan, okay, let's start designing it. What, what do we need? Who do we need? What kinds of things do we have to have? Okay, then you go in and you get one of the natural elements you need. You gotta have data. If you're talking AI, you need large amounts of data. Okay, and so, you know, where is that data gonna come from? How, how are we gonna get it? Whose data is it on there? So you gotta collect the data, and then after you get this big glob of data, guess what? You gotta clean it. You know, it's like gathering a whole bunch of fish. You know, <laughs> if you get a whole bunch of data, all you got there is a bunch of stinky data. You gotta clean it and make sure that the systems can understand it. You have to make sure that it's uniform so the systems can handle it and, and go through it in an effective manner. You know, then we talk about the, um, the model. How is the model going to be trained? What, what algorithms are we going to use? What do we need to do to get this thing, to get, at the end of the day, we want to tell this, we want to know how this, how much water is in a bottle, okay? So we collect data on bottles, we collect the data on water, we collect data, and we got to train the algorithm to tell us how to get that. Then once we get the, get the model, we got to start training it and then make sure we test it, test it to make sure that it's going to give us accurate results. And then it goes back through, you know, what does it look like? What's the report look like? What does the output look like? And is it accurate? Again, high level. Now I added this in there, I added this one in, because sometimes when you work through, um, I added this in from my own little brain when I first started looking at this stuff several years ago. And I added this in there just to get my brain wrapped around it as far as what makes up an AI, when you talk AI, it's, people think of it as, as a magic box, okay? There's lots of parts in the magic box, so we're gonna talk about these different parts, going from hardware all the way up to AI. And these are all important because, <clears throat> just like you're doing, a, if you're doing incident response on a computer, that's one thing. If you're doing incident response on the cloud, you need to know where all the data is and how it affects. If you're doing incident response on the AI system or, or uh, on systems that contain AI, you need to know all the different moving parts. So where would you go look if something were to go bad? That's why we're going down this path. All right, when you look at uh, hardware, again, hardware could be local, it could be in the cloud, it could be a hybrid mix, depending on what, what kind of system you have, how you're doing it. Maybe what kind of data you're running, whether it's uh, classified data or non class you know, and where does it live? You know, graphical processing units, and I'm not going to go through all the definitions there, but I mean, some of the big ones that you hear all the time are GPUs, which are really great at math. You know, tensor processing units, they're only in Google, they're only in the cloud. I'll start with Google, I think they sold part of their the licensing, started in like 2015. Tensor processing units are really interesting devices because what allows uh, folks that are doing AI, when you talked about neural networks, that's where tensor processing units excel. So um, if you had to develop a AI and develop a model using just GPUs, it may take you months for that thing to run. With a tensor processing unit, it will can do it in weeks to days. And so that's where it's a specialized use. Uh, field programmable gate arrays, those are actually very old, but they're being used more and more now. The programmable chips, basically. Um, you, know, you can go through there, you know, memory and storage. So again, that's part of the part of the backbone for how you get it to work. You know, then we have libraries and frameworks. You know, and so um, there are a lot of, you can see on the, the different ones up there, there are a lot of pre-built functions and modules out there. Uh, that you can use to build, train AI models. Now, here's one of the downsides. Um, with any model, and this is something that, that companies are looking to dealing with, countries are dealing with, a lot of the AI models that are out there, 
unless you built it, how do you know what's in it? How do you know who put what in it, what, what data is contained in there, and how does it work? It's a magic black box. You know, it's a magic piece of code in there. And it's really easy to go there and to go, you know, TensorFlow, PyTorch, and you say, oh yeah, download this, and look, I made this, I made this AI, you know, system in really quick time. Well, how do you know that it's accurate? You know, and so we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. But anyway, that's part of the next part of the AI chain is you know, libraries and frameworks. You know, then there's additional, there's pre-trained models that you can also download, additional pre-trained models you can download. You can see the ones that are up there. These are just some of the more common ones that are up there. Or you can make your own. You know, it gets down to, you know, what skills and abilities you and your team have. Training and fine-tuning. This is training and fine-tuning of the systems. Training and fine-tuning of the model. Making sure that the model is doing what it's tasked to do. Making sure that it's not doing something bizarre and strange. Uh, making sure that the information coming out there is acceptable. AI applications and services. Again, this is just, these are already, these may not be part of your model. These may not be part of your AI. These are like, think of it as software as a service. These are AI as a service, if you will. You throw chat GPT in there. But you can set up APIs. A lot of times people, I was telling a story earlier before, before you guys came in. My son, who is, uh, he, he graduated, he's a geothermal engineer. And I just graduated, he has his first job, thank goodness, you know, that makes all three of my children, my, all three of my boys are out working hard and, uh, you know, contributing to society. And, um, but before he got out, he and his five little engineering buddies that lived in a house, he, go, he told me, he goes, Dad, he goes, what I want to do is, he goes, I want to make as much money as I can by not, and not work. I said, okay, son, how are you going to do that? He goes, oh, we, we've been working on these great things. He goes, we, we've, been, we've been selling books and selling, uh, selling uh, movies and, and, and soundtracks to YouTube and other ones. I said, well, how much you made, son? It was like three dollars and something. <laughs> and I said, "Well, I think that money model is going to take a little bit of time, you know." But basically, what he did was what, what they did is they actually put together all the APIs, and so they had ChatGPT write a story, and then they piped that over to another service that would then put the put the, the voice to it, and then they put that to another service that would put the movie to it. And so I, I he, he played one for me, and all of a sudden I was listening to. Uh, uh, Denzel Washington, uh, I was listening also, also to somebody else read some. I said, son, I said, how did you get these soundtracks? Oh, the computer did it. We did it with these APIs. And I said, did you get these people with permission? He goes, well, no, I didn't need it. I goes, I didn't say it was their name. I said, no. I said, no, you can't do that. Stop. Don't do that. <laughs> you know, but so anyway, you can actually do a, a really cool, remarkable things with APIs, linking them all together out there. Um, if you're in business, yeah, you have to own it. Um, adaptive AI applications. These are very interesting. You see these a lot of times in, in airlines. You see them a lot of times in um, uh, various business things as far as being able to adapt in real time. Zillow is one. Zillow is a great adaptive AI. Um, and, you know, Priceline is an adaptive AI. So depending on what, what's happening in the world, what's happening at the time, you know, it, it changes and, and revalues them. All right, let's get talking a little bit about securing AI. Now, when you're talking about that, again, you're talking about securing data. You know, when you're talking about securing hardware. Um, so one of the first things you need to do, you know, if you're gonna have AI in your organization, you're also gonna have AI, is look to see what is your security controls? What do you currently have in there? Do you have controls in place that will work for what you want to do. You have uh, that will handle AI, they'll handle the data, handle the hardware, handle the models on there. And then you gotta decide, you know, do you have the necessary requirements or not? Again, data is your largest asset in this model, in this thing. Data is your gold uh, in there. And as you can see, that then means really need to have a very strong data governance program. If you're talking AI, you got to have data governance in there. And it's not, I mean, you need to have it more for real. 
You know, you have to have, you know, is data, is data yours? Is the data quality? Um, you know, you, you have data architects in place. You, know, you have a good data life cycle in place. Uh, secure storage in place. And we're gonna talk more on this down the road. This is just a quick overview. Um, AI needs the right people to retain and, and re, you know, you need to have the right people for AI. You can probably you look right now, there's some articles in the newspaper, or newspaper, I'm dating myself. There's some articles on the, on the web um, recently about uh, how much AI engineers were making, prompt engineers, AI architects were making, usually salaries of four to six hundred thousand dollars in there. Um, that's because supply and demand. There's not enough supply to meet the current demand. Many organizations, you know, you can go out and you hire a consultant, you're paying them five hundred dollars an hour, a thousand dollars an hour, and they're good for if you have a short term need, you know, on there. But if you're trying to sustain this thing for a long period of time, you gotta grow the talent, you gotta build the talent in there. Um, one of the things that we've seen that's worked very well is retraining some of your folks to, you know, maybe they, they don't have the full AI skills you need, but they have great skills with data and you start training them towards an AI field. Um, you, you get somebody who has computer science background and you know, start training them up. So retraining is a, is a good one right now. Um, here's a big one, you know, as far as uh, AI goes. You know, so now you're thinking about having AI, the boss says we're gonna have one. We talked about the hardware, we talked about the different data models. You know, so it's a lot of data. You know, a lot of a lot of software security in there, a lot of software engineering in there. Um, you know, so now you got to start thinking about okay, next up, how do we secure all of this? You know, and so you need to make sure that uh, you know you have an understanding of what are the threats out there. And apparently, one of my threats is typing, but you need <laughs> some threats out there. Um, you also need to. Uh, be able to, um, oh yeah, I'm in, I'm just a type, I think I was typing that late, um, I apologize. Uh, you know, you have to be able to know how you're gonna respond to the different attacks. There's about two or three typos in there, so I apologize for this slide. Um, but again, uh, you really have to think about how your data's gonna be attacked, who's going to attack it, and where it's going, where's it gonna get attacked. We're going to talk about some of the AI attacks that are out there now, um, out there. And there's a lot of these ones that are very similar. There's just a little tweaks off. Uh, and where these come from, I'm going, where these come from, and you'll see it at the end, this actually came from NIST, and they uh, actually outlined these as different risks different, that are out there. And so you'll I'll have the, doc, the links out there. You'll, and you guys will get these slide decks or part that we, we're, that go to, I guess you guys give it an AFCS, AFC, I want to fill it in now. I'm just going to forget it. You're going to get the slides, <laughs> put it that way. Um, but anyway, evasion attacks. You know, so again, these are attacks that are looking to, um, these, I really think of these more or less, when, when, when I think of these type of attacks, because they're trying to fuel, fool a human. So what, really what it gets down to is if you get a picture and you put some noise in it and you say, okay, this really isn't a water bottle computer. This is actually a whatever. You know, and by putting enough noise bits, for those of you who used to do steganography or do steganography, you can know you know about putting noise in, in, in images um, or being able to take noise out of <coughs> images. Uh, you can use the same kind of technique for evasion attacks. You know, another one is poisoning attacks. And that again is going after your training data, uh, where you're trying to inject misleading information in there or malicious information. Um, you know, I see all these different, um, you know, news reels and different ads about uh, autonomous weaponry, autonomous vehicles in there. You know, what if you could make this, you know, instead of being, um, and I'm really gonna date myself, so, when my uh, mom was alive, she was she was alive in the during World War II, and as a kid, she used to have to carve wooden models of airplanes, and they paint them they paint them black. And what these were for, they said them over for spotters. So if you saw the certain silhouette, it was that type of airplane. 
you know, so if you knew it was this type of silhouette, it was an American airplane, or that type of silhouette, it was a German airplane, okay? So things like this, if you could tell the, tell the AI that this shape of an airplane isn't a, um, you know, you pick the adversary, isn't an adversarial airplane, it's actually one of ours. You know, the AI will go, cool, it's good, it's safe. So that's a poisoning attack. All right, model extraction attack. In a model extraction attack, you're actually going in and you're trying to steal the model. You're going, you, the model, it's kind of like stealing IP. Somebody else put all the time and effort, weeks and months, training this thing, building it, making it really worth some money, and you're stealing it. You're stealing the secret sauce. Membership inference attacks. You know, this type of attack, you're actually um, looking to see how somebody, what is the thought process behind the model? How are they developing the model so that you can guess how the model will act under other circumstances? So if I know that you use the, the US code or something to, to write a model, let's look, I'm really gonna get thrown rocks. Let's say you were gonna use the IRS tax code and you wanted to develop a, you know, something well, if I knew that you used the IRS tax code and you, and you looked at these certain chapters in there, then I know that if I ask it a question, it should give me this answer. So based on inference, so based on what you've done already, I know that this is what the answer is going to be. So I know how to get around whatever I'm trying to get around. All right, Trojan attacks. Uh, just like in the real world, just like a, a regular computer, you know, when you're talking about this, it, putting in <coughs> code or back doors into a model during the training phase, so that, that you know, so it doesn't know that uh, you know it misses something, it, it misses or misclassifies something. All right. Um, adversarial tax. This could be done by a person, by a computer. <coughs> And that's where you're trying to exploit a vulnerability just like in any other system that you may have where vulnerability is exploited, you know, so that it doesn't, you know, you, it doesn't give the intended outcome. You get some unintended outcome. And I had it where it's playing and I apologize. And uh, it could look cooler when it plays. War games, there you go. 19, what is it, 83, I think, when this thing came out on there. But it, it's still, it's so fun to watch that, sorry. I tried to get them to play in here, and I think it's because they don't have internet on here. It's, it's not linking up. But um, war games, did anybody in here not see war games? I know there's some youngsters in the back. Has anybody not seen war games? All right. So war games is always very interesting now because, you know, you see somebody, you see somebody, an 18-year-old or something that tries to find a backdoor of a system, you know, to play a game. Tries to find the lady, he's a gamer, trying to find the latest games in there. And uh, he finds a system and it turns out to be, uh, you know, a system that runs the nuclear weapons. And, you know, it's interesting now because when you look at this movie, if you watch this movie again, after you learn more about AI, you can start checking off all the things, all the different types of attacks, all the things that the AI didn't do correctly in there. And so it's really a lot of fun when you watch it now, if you learn more about AI and you actually watch it. Um, to see what happens. So, has anybody, was anybody in this room at, at uh, uh, RSA this year, in San Francisco? So RSA this year, we had about 40,000 folks, and the majority of it was dealing uh, with AI this year. And so they had a lot of folks in there dealing with AI, and uh, one of the keynote speakers was Matthew Broderick, was one of the keynote speakers. And it was really hilarious because he comes on and he goes, uh, he goes, you're probably wondering why I'm here, you know, and everybody's clapping for him and everything, and everything, and then he goes, he goes, oh, and then they start playing this clip, they start playing the background, you know, on there, they start playing the, the, the movie on there, and again, everybody's clapping, and this is, we're talking probably 15,000 people in this giant auditorium, you know, all, ah, go nuts, on there. So some of the stories that, that, that came out of this, I'll share with you the heat that Matthew Broderick told. So, um, uh, one of them, this was, I really thought was interesting. So at the time when war games happened in 1983, uh, that time frame, who was president? 
Thank you very much. Ronald Reagan, that is correct. Ronald Reagan was the president. And one of Ronald Reagan's favorite things to do while president was he enjoyed, really loved, because he had used to be an actor, really loved movies. And so he absolutely loved movies. And so he was at Camp David, ready to watch war games for the first time. And so he watches war games, and he literally almost fell off his chair. He's watching this thing. So the next day, they have a full cabinet meeting. He calls everybody in. They have a full cabinet meeting. This is a true, true story. They have a full cabinet meeting. Everybody comes in there, and he asks. You know, he goes, has anybody seen this? Has anybody seen this movie? Yes, Mr. President, we've seen the movie. Well, can this happen? I want to know, can this happen? And they go, um, you know, they're all looking down. It's like, uh, Mr. President, it's so much worse. This is what happened in real life. And so at that time frame, then you'll start seeing multiple um, government initiatives, multiple acts being, being enacted because of this movie on there. And so I thought that was really interesting. Um, Another thing, I took it the other day on there. You know, the, 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 the big computer in there, in the, in the system, the big computer in there is Whopper, okay? Well, what Whopper was, was an Apple IIe that somebody, <laughs> that's what was running this, this, the Whopper for this movie was an Apple IIe, which is an old Apple computer in there, but state of the art back in the day. And uh, the other thing that Matthew brought up, said, just as a final note, was that, uh, he goes, he's all nervous about getting the part because he couldn't type in there. And he took typing classes and everything else. And so he, he put all this time and effort trying to get to where he's a typer because then he's seen showing him like any hacker, you know, like going at it. And so you know, he, he's feeling pretty good. And they said, no, no, that's okay. You can type where you want because we actually have somebody in the background typing all your information in and out. So you didn't have to you didn't have to type. So anyway, that was that was war games. But seriously though, um, while you're learning AI, you're going through it, watch the movie sometime. It really will give you a whole different perspective. The other thing I'll show you is that even though that movie was, what, 40 something years old now, and how much things have, that are the same. How many attacks still work? You know, it's pretty, it's pretty hilarious. Or sad, depending on your viewpoint. All right, AI attack vectors. Um, data privacy attacks. Uh, going down, this is the last of our, uh, the last one or one more, oh actually we have one more. Data privacy attacks, again, to exploiting uh, vulnerabilities and how the data, as far as how the AI handles data, as far as how it's looking. So you think of large language models, how the model is handling the data. And last but not least, algorithmic bias. Um, now this one, bias is interesting because Bias uh, could be intentional. You know, you could have somebody who's intentionally biased in there. But most of the time, a lot of the times, it's unintentional. Okay, so if you get, if all you do is hire people who look like me, or people who look like you, or people who have the same religious beliefs, or people that have the same part of the country, or people, you know, you can see, if you get all the same, you get these biases in there. And you don't mean for biases to come in, you know, but biases come in. For those of you who are from the South down here, I, I grew up in, in Florida, so I say y'all a lot. You know, people from the North look at me like I have three heads. Like, what are you talking about, you know? And so that's a bias, you know, because of, of where I grew up. All right, let's talk about some AI incident. This is actually called the AI Incident Database. Uh, I'd highly recommend you go out and play with it sometime. It's been going on for, I think, three years, four years. Last year, this, this graphic that's made represents 108,000 uh, incidents that happened. Now, an incident for, and I'm using incident, when I say incident for AI, is not the same as incident we talked about for FISMA, okay? And we'll talk, you'll see it in just a minute. So it's a little bit different. They're using the term incident, I think I tried to label it something else, but the AI incident da database is things that happen with AI. All right, so here's, here's the first one. Uh, our, buddy, our buddies have met up for, for a long time. This was in uh, 
for the Wall Street Journal in 2024. And um, you could go out on, on uh, their site and there are all kinds of ads for drugs. And so then people started suing, suing because it's like, hey, my son, daughter, husband, wife got addicted and they, they went out there and they found it on public media, on social media, and now we're coming after you on there. And so this was, again was a lack of filtering, a lack of uh, on the AI that, hey, maybe I shouldn't talk about you can get X, Y, and Z. So that was one incident. Here's one that was a little bit interesting. On there, this is called a, a, a uh, beta version of a Roomba. And uh, a lady found pictures of herself sitting on the commode, posted to Facebook, and it came from the AI Roomba uh, that was running around the house with taking pictures of all kinds of things and uploading it uh, up there, operating outside of its code, outside of its uh, intended purpose on there, and was happily uploading pictures of her sitting there. And so, uh, you know, she sued on there. There's a Roomba J7 series on there. So for all of you who have Roombas on there, you can look, you can look at it with a little jaundice eye. You know, it's, it, it's very interesting to think in our lives how much AI, how much, you know, IoT, these devices we invite into our homes. And I do it too. We all, we all do it for, for ease of use, right? So. You know, you have your, your Nest thermostat or your auto your thermostat that can tell you what's going on in your house. You know, you have cameras that are feeding up to who knows where, probably made in, you know, overseas in Asia or somewhere, you know, they're feeding data to who knows where. You know, you have, uh, you, know, uh, you know, Siri, you have this, that, and whatever. But anyway, don't point out some, some tangent. This is this one that happened up in January. Here's a very sad one that happened. Uh, this is last year. Uh, this was Tesla. The uh, gentleman was going down the highway at a high rate of speed. It was on uh, the dr auto driver mode. He was laid back in his sleep, uh, sleeping in his car, and rear ended a fire truck, killed him, and, and uh, hurt four firefighters in there. Again, the AI did not recognize the flashing lights, did not recognize the flares as at night, didn't recognize anything. And you know, didn't think about. Hey, even though I'm programmed and told to slow down based on these parameters in my model, you know, flashing lights, I should stop. You know, uh, all these different parameter safety protocols they had, it didn't happen. It didn't work. So, you know, that it's like it just had a glitch. Didn't do it. Here's a very sad one as well. Um, this one actually happened overseas. Uh, a Belgian woman. Her husband was actually um, having a romantic affair with the AI chatbot. Um, over there, it's called Eliza. That uh, was the name of the chatbot. And he was talking about how he had been sad and wanting to die. He wanted to be with her and then wanted to die. And she basically said, yeah, why don't you go ahead and join me? And he did. You know, he, he, he pulled the trigger and that was it. You know, and so, um, as more and more AI comes out, and more and more realistic AI comes out, and more lonely people come out, I mean, just think of the impact of that, you know, software, they don't realize, they, they lose track of, you know, you can look on Instagram, I was looking at my son's Instagram, he looks at it, he goes, look, this is AI on there, and, you know, some scantily clad young lady on this thing, you know, and I mean, you can make these people, you know, look like whatever, and so you get somebody who's lonely or easy manipulated, you know, and it can really cause a lot of damage. Here's one talking about bias. This young lady on the uh, left, the Asian uh, young lady, she wanted to, she's an MIT grad, she wanted to make herself look uh, more professional for, she wanted to get more professional headshot to, uh, for her, for her um, a resume and everything. And she used a service called uh, Playground and it, this is what the guy, she uploaded her picture and said, this is the changes you need to make. Turn her from looking from Asian to looking non-Asian. You know, and so I mean, you know, that's bias in its biggest, in its largest form. These sites, uh, you might want to take a picture of this one if you're interested or write it down. These are the NIST ones. One just came out. Uh, the AI, the NIST AI Risk Management Framework. 
uh, came, oh, I screwed, scratch that. The Trustworthy Responsible AI came out uh, in July. It just came out. And there's some information we'll be walking through on here. This is for risk management for AI systems. So you can see from the incidents that we, we talked about just a minute ago, before I delve into the next slides, um, you can see how we, uh, some of the incidents that we had. You know, this is just a handful. There, there are a lot in that database when you look at them. Like I said, the last year was 108,000. And they're not all bad boy ones. Some are silly funny ones. Some are the other ones uh, that are in there. But this is just starting. This is just the tip of the iceberg, okay? So this is just coming out. So when you guys think about AI, you think, oh, wouldn't it be great to put AI in a drone? Wouldn't it be great to put AI in X, Y, or Z? It would. It could do a lot of wonderful things. But you've really got to make sure that it's doing wonderful things. You know, so a level of AI requires a level of responsibility. All right, so the risks that we see. Uh, again, this is using the, the NIST framework uh, for AI on there, and some of these you can already, we've already talked about. Individual harm to persons, civil liberties, rights or physical or psychological safety, or generally committed suicide. So they nailed that one right off the bat. Um, you know, harm to a group, you know, such as talking about discrimination or some, some other population. You know, AI now, uh, especially we're gearing up for another campaign season, and not talking politics, either side, whatever, whoever you like to vote for is great, you know, but the, using AI for uh, changing the way large groups of people think is a very easy thing to do. And so it's, it's, truly, a, uh, it's truly a risk. You could change society with it. You know, when you look at harm to an organization, um, you know, AI can do a lot of remarkable things. It can do a and we'll talk a little bit about using it in instant response. You can do a lot of wonderful things, but if you don't know what it's doing, if it's still a magic box to you, then you, you get what you get. You know, harm to an ecosystem. You know, one of the things about um, AI, <coughs> excuse me, is the compute power. And I was reading an article uh, yesterday, as a matter of fact, it takes, if you're training a mid-sized model, it takes on average about, um, a week to do that. It says you're using the carbon footprint of having 300,000 jets fly for a month. You know, and I mean, it was, it was incredible to think about you know, how much the carbon footprint is. Um, Europe, this is their, this is their AI risk, uh, risk, risk, risk register, or risk, how they, how they calculate risks in there. And as you can see in there, you know, their biggest thing, their biggest, the biggest risk that they're looking at is, um, you know, how does it impact people? How does it impact surveillance of people? How does it impact uh, manipulating people? You know, so that is, a, that is their unacceptable risk. You know, then it gets down to how is it impacting public service? How is it impacting how people do their day-to-day -day jobs? You know, and then you go down to limited risk. Um, limited risk are, you know, chat bots, emotion bots, all these different things. They have to disclose what they're doing and how they're doing. All right, so going through NIST, again, this uses the, using the NIST AI risk, uh, risk they brought up. I think there's uh, 10 of those that we'll go through. The first one is very interesting. It's talking about um, using, using uh, generative AI to you know, learn how to and deal with and use it for bad things. Um, as you can see there, you know, chemical uh, weapons, uh, chemical, biological, rock, radiological, or nuclear. In the, the, the problem is when I used to when I used to work counterintelligence, and you're dealing with a spy, um, or if those of you who do opsec, how many people here do opsec? Couple. Okay, so if you're a good spy or you're a good social engineer, same thing. Okay, but if if you're that type of person, if I went up and walked up to this gentleman right here and I said, "Hey, tell me." Uh, Tell me about your job and about your, uh, what exactly do you do and what kind of classification level do you hold and this, that, whatever. Red flags would be bing, 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 bing. All of us would do that, you know? Be like, what the heck? But if I asked you one question, let's say we all work together, and I asked him one question, asked him one question, asked her one question, they're all different questions, I'm asking him at different times, 
very innocuous, and I'm collecting information. A good spy or a good social engineering person is somebody who can collect that information one question at a time, one easy going laugh at a time, one little email at a time, you know, one little chat on a chat service at a time, and I put that all together. And sometimes it can take a lot of time. You know, if you're looking for a specific target, you'd have to learn more about the target, learn more about what they like, you know, and you know, as more and more information comes online, you know, their job gets much, much more easier. You know, fake, you know, people put their information online, you know, so I can learn half the battle just, just going online and doing it. But what they're worried about in this particular risk is they're worried about that generative AI will collect that information and serve it up, not intentionally, but because the model was done incorrectly. And so it's collecting all this information that's open source, perhaps, but if you get, for those of you who are in classified positions, if you get enough open source information and you string it together in a certain way, all of a sudden it's classified, <laughs> you know? And so, same thing with this. If you can get enough open source information uh, and learn how to put it together, you know, so they're worried about AI doing it. You know, so the next one is, uh, I love this term, confabulation. That's, that's, uh, that's basically uh, what I call it, is, I call it AI WAG. And if you guys know what WAG is, I'm not gonna tell you what that is, but you guys can figure out what WAG is. But, uh, but that's basically the AI going, I don't really know, but I think it's maybe, let's say it's that. That's good, you know? And so uh, there's a, a couple of articles about a, an attorney in a federal case in New York uh, three years ago, I guess it was, who cited some cases that he searched on uh, uh, ChatGPT, and it came back and it said, okay, here you go, here are the cases. Put them out, he put them in his legal document, he filed it and found out that there were, there were not, <laughs> not real cases. He did not do his research. He did not trust but verify. And so it was just the AI trying to be a good AI and saying, yeah, here's the answer. So, so anytime you see confabulation, it also means wag. All right, the next one, um, again, this is what we, we talked about a little bit about uh, you know, AI, generative AI could, could really be used for, for ugly things if it's not handled correctly. And I'm not picking on any generative AI. I'm just saying the way that they're built and the way that they deliver information. That's why it's so important to make sure you know what's going into it on there. They can be useful. You know, they're worried about it being used for, you know, hate, hate groups and that kind of thing. Uh, data privacy, uh, data leakage. Up until about a year ago, maybe nine months ago, those of you who use Amazon, I use Amazon. Those of you who use Amazon, you go into the search bar and you're looking for, I need a 24 pack of water bottles. You know, 24 pack of water bottles. You can also go up to the same search engine and you can type in anything you want to know about. Hey, tell me about nuclear weapons. Okay, not really, not nuclear weapons. But you can type in things like that and the way its model was trained and the way that they had it not locked down, it would happily go on the internet and search anything you wanted. And so you could, it would just spit out all the information. So again, data leakage. It didn't mean for it to do that, but the AI was trying to do the right thing. It said, okay, you're looking for X. I don't have it in the, in the Amazon stack, so, but I found it on the internet, here you go. <coughs> again, environmental impacts, we talked about that a little bit, about the, uh, how much, how much your, you know, energy is being used for generative AI. Uh, it's mind-numbing how much AI, how much is being used. You'll see more and more data centers coming up. In fact, there's an article in the Wall Street Journal last week. One of the number one jobs right now for, for folks who have no education, or maybe they go to community college for about three months and they earn $100,000, is working data centers. Data centers now are like gold, you know, and so they're trying to build them everywhere and they can't get people for them. And so that's, uh, because again, they need energy. So I think here, there aren't you guys bringing on, for those who live here, aren't they bringing on Southern, uh, bringing on like two more nukes? Or uh, just brought on two more nukes on there, here, for energy. You know, and so you'll see a lot more data centers coming here, I'm sure. Um, talking about bias, again, this is another one. This, this is uh, one of the risks they outline. I just used the example of the young lady we talked about earlier. Um, bias is a real thing. It's, a, again, a, most of the time, uh, well, I shouldn't say most of the time, I can't say that. 
I would hope that most of the time it's unintentional bias uh, it, when it's going into the programming of models. That being said, though, you could have people who are not uh, favors, you know, who don't like a particular country, they don't like a particular, uh, you know, ethnicity, they don't like a particular race, they don't like a particular whatever, and they train your data that way. Um, you know, it could have large impacts. Uh, factor opinion. This kind of gets back to the WAG. Uh, depending on how your model is trained, depending on what you put into the model, depending on the safety checks you have in there, uh, the model can give you a fact or an opinion. <laughs> and so it's almost like a WAG. Again, these are the NIST risks that we're, we're covering right now. Um, you know, as far as um, human AI configurations, uh, this really gets back to the, the example I gave earlier about the gentleman who committed suicide overseas. You know, you can get people so wrapped up in AI, so wrapped up in the conversations. You know, so many people pull out their phones, and you know, my kids all do, and you know, type in, they're texting each other all the time and everything. You know, you can sign up to have a, a new friend, and your new friend is a, is a, is a chat. You know, it's, it's just an AI doing it on there. And you may know it or you may not know it. You know, but you can Im impact people's uh, emotions, impact the way they think so much that they've outlined this now as a risk. Um, you know, as far as the uh, you know, information security goes, you know, this is talking about, this is getting back to our regular day-to-day -day security issues. This particular risk is Anytime you have a system, any system, and you're talking about securing it, that's what we're talking about here. Making sure that, that this is secure from all of your normal day-to-day -day cyber issues. Um, this is one that's uh, coming more and more popular now. Uh, I mentioned you about the we thought he was trying to come up with a good money-making aspect of uh, putting actors' voices to things. And now, you know, now they're going after it. You know, this is a risk now for, for IP, you know, for whether you're a singer, a writer, or a whatever, it's having your work copied and having your work put out there to make it look like you know it's their work. Uh, deep fakes. Deep fakes has been a huge problem, um, especially there's you know there's I don't know. I read the other day I think there's like, they, there, you know, they said like 20 right off the bat of these systems out there where you can happily take a picture of. Uh, the person dressed and throw it out there and it comes back and see what they look like nude. They've had you put people's heads on the you know, things. And, I mean, it's, uh, of AI is, uh, can do remarkable things. It can really do some terrible things. Um, you know, so as far as this one that they brought up here is now, you know, making, you know, obscene and pornographic uh, uh, stuff. So NIST is recognizing that as a, uh, as a risk. And rightfully so. Um, Value chain, um, this is a big one. This is a big one that, that all of you in, in your organizations, if you're dealing with anything with AI, value chain is really important. And the reason why is because we treat AI as a magic black box. You don't know what's going into the magic black box. You don't know how the magic box was trained. You don't know how the magic box, the information it's giving you is correct. And now you put that into what are your key elements of a system. Whether that's an autonomous system, whether that is having your, where your water delivered every day, whatever. But if the, the, you know, if part of your value chain is an AI that you have not uh, vetted, or a model, or an algorithm that you have not vetted, you know, you could have a significant problem. So you'll see more and more um, more and more supply chain packs happen with this. All right, so we talked a little bit about this. This is a uh, this is from the the NIST AI RMF playbook. There's actually uh, uh, it's cited there uh, in there allows you to govern, map, measure, and manage um, the risks inside your organization. And what they actually have, you can download from NIST. For those of you who are in the compliance side of the house, I know it's not exciting, but for those of you in the compliance side of the house, uh, they provide some really good uh, 
Excel spreadsheets, uh, CSV, JSON, um, different, all kinds of different formats to how you can go ahead and map out your risks. You know, it puts in there you know, the type of risk, who's going to deal with the risk, how, you know, how is it going to get handled. It allows you a good way to, to map out your risks. All right, let's talk a little bit about incident response plans on AI systems. So when you're going through with your with AI and your incident response, it is similar to what you've been doing for the most part, but you need you need to go through and I'm gonna just this show over here, I'm gonna go to the next next slide here. So as far as on AI, you really need to make sure that you have the policies in place, dealing with your models, dealing with the data, dealing with how you're going, how it's going to be handled. Um, you need to set up a good monitoring activities inside there. You need to make sure that the, the data is, you know, what's going in is clean, the data coming out is accurate. You need to make sure that you have the people in place to be able to do this. Um, you know, and you need to have the controls in place to be able to do that. We'll talk a little bit more in just a minute about the controls. You know, on containment, um, you know, when you're looking at, just like you would on a regular uh, incident response plan, you know, and you're going through containment in there, it's somewhat but different, okay? So this incident could be one that you caused, that the system caused or you know, a third party cause on there. So you need, but you still need to be able to address the damage. You need to make, you need to stop the bleeding. You need to be able to, to capture the data and see what's going on there. You need to be able to implement um, directives and have people ready to be able to address it. And you need, you need to be able to apply fixes and, and get it done. As far as eradication goes, um, Eradication on AI is going to be hard. And the reason why is if you're dealing with the large language models on there. Um, and I have, we're going to talk about this a little bit more detail in just a minute, but in large language models, you develop it, you need to catalog it, you need to track it. Large language models are, are an asset, and just like you would, you would classify and categorize all of your assets, you need to do this with your models, with your algorithms, with the training data that you know when, when you have an incident that happens, how far back does it go? It's kind of like thinking of um, uh, system, system backups. Okay, where's my last good known backup? Same thing with these models. Where's my last known good, good model? And is it really good? You know, you have to test it to train and, and to make sure that it is. Just like you would with uh, putting a, a patch system on, let's say you have a system that got hacked into and you uh, roll it back to the last known good and then you make sure that it's fully patched, same thing here. Lessons learned, you know, lessons learned is one of the, the biggest things you can do. How do you prevent it from happening again? And then make sure that you share the documentation and the lessons learned with the other people in your organization or other organizations, your peer organizations as well. All right, um, tabletops. How many people here in the room now do tabletops in their current, not talking about AI, but just from your security posture? How many people? A couple? Yeah, I, I'm a big believer in tabletops as far as it, it, it really shows a light on there. Um, you gotta make sure you brief your bosses <laughs> a little bit there, but it really does show a light on the holes inside your policies and procedures. Your incident response plan is an example. You know, you run a tabletop and, and uh, hey, 60 minutes is calling. You know, well, you don't want the boss calling and talking to 60 minutes. You know, you wanna have the, the PR person, you wanna have the legal person, you wanna have whatever. You know, but, uh, but, with, but with AI, Again, an AI tabletop includes not only what an incident is considered for FISMA, but it's also dealing with 
the incidents that we talked about earlier. It could be somebody had a romantic uh, liaison with the uh, chatbot and they killed themselves. It could be the young lady who had the bias that popped up. These are all incidents. These are all things that need to be addressed. And so what, what's interesting about this is that when you do a tabletop like this with AI, and let's say all your AI does is um, some mundane task. It's, uh, the AI is dealing with the, the best time to reorder water bottles. Um, you have to go through it and throw the curveballs in there, just like Amazon. I told you Amazon, you can search Amazon for anything there for a while. You can throw that, you can throw that out there that we use that same example to a company in Utah. And we said, hey, what if your what if your AI started spitting out information about this, this, and this? And we did it, we put it in the tabletop. And they looked at it, they looked at each other and said, Morris wouldn't do that. Well, how do you know? Oh, it was just wouldn't do that. You know, and I said, well, it did. Here, here's an example. It did, it did this and this. Here you go. Now what are you going to do? And if you don't have a good plan in place, if you don't have a good incident response plan in place, you're sitting there running around in circles. It's his job. It's her job. It's, you know, why did this happen? And it's a blame game. It's not, let's solve it. You know, and that's where incident response plan and tabletop really help you do. It helps you find the gaps in your, in your plan. It helps you tighten them up so that you're not doing that in real life. Now some of the key areas you want to look at here on the tabletop for AI specifically. You know, again, it's very similar, very similar to what you do in a tabletop for a cyber, a cyber event. It is a cyber event, don't get me wrong, but it could be a cyber, the AI incident, if you will. But you're still going to have the same things. Who do you have in the room? You know, who, who are the people, you know, what are their, their assigned the tasks? Do you have communications involved? You know, you have the resources identified, who's going to actually make the hard decision? Go, no, go. Also in the, uh, also in the, um, uh, in the NIST guide there, and going, and going through that, you know, when you're uh, talking about automating defenses in there uh, for, for new threats. AI can do a lot of things really good. AI can parse to a lot of data. Um, AI can uh, tell you what magic did. Uh, AI can um, you know, give you certain answers. However, it's not a magic. It's not a magic gun. <laughs> um, AI cannot do things like uh, when you need a human involved. You know, any of these events, you still need to have humans involved uh, when you're dealing with AI. Do not let it just run amok out there. Um, and with that, I apologize. I'm actually missing about five slides. <laughs> I apologize. I'm thinking put the wrong version up on this thing. Um, on, uh, on final thoughts on there, how many people here in the room currently are involved with AI to some extent in your organizations? So what kind of things are you dealing with with, with AI in yours? Just from a high scale. The um, focusing the use cases on the, the, the right data, just on the right. That's a good one. I mean, that, 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 that's hard for most companies. You know, that's, 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 a, that's a, you're right, that happens a lot. Um, the gentleman behind you also, I think he, uh, you know, uh, So I'll jump in the back, raise his hand. I've been researching the use of LLMs to analyze code. Uh, get some interesting results. Lots of the same question, five times in a row. And it changes its mind four times. Lots of the same question, if you add one phrase, and it converges to a definite decision. So, how do you phrase the question? Way too sensitive. <laughs> and how do you phrase the question? Yeah. 
I'm sorry, sir, do you have some help? Yeah, I just didn't put So I can't talk about what we're really, what we're Yeah, 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 no worries. But I was with a previous company. And they were using uh, uh, to, to facilitate um, uh, certain types of responses we have to have to the government, uh, the RFIs and whatnot. So they actually trained, trained it on like, a large body of data of previous responses, and it was getting good results. We tried to extend the model to include uh, a bunch of data from government solicitations and the model in the paper. So just the, the, the data just didn't so how many companies now are, are how many folks in here are actually looking to build an AI in the next two years? You guys are you guys are and if you can talk about it, if it, it's not some super secret squirrel thing, what kind of what kind of use cases are you guys looking for, just from a high level? Well, let me tell you the risk that we're running into and that should kind of elucidate what the Variant thought, as the gentleman back there was saying, very variant output example. Um, you brought up the legal case for the gentleman editing processing of the Supreme Court document. The Supreme Court's actually a comment. Um, seen models where SF operators, based on their observations of tactics, were identified as hostile entities in the battle. And for anything with an autonomous response capability, that is that's a self green on green attack effectiveness. AI incident, whether it culminates in a launch or a detonation or not, that still is technically from the output a threat to force our government. And not finding ways to eliminate that risk like the gentleman back there. I don't want to be down range, I don't want anyone else down range if anything like that happens. Yeah. Because that's that's not terrible. Yeah, no, like I said, it's thank you for the example. Thank you all for your for your comments. The yeah, AI, like I said, it is a it's gonna be an amazing tool and it's growing into an amazing tool. But we've gotta make sure that we have the harness on it. You gotta make sure that you can track the risk with it, you gotta make sure that you can Really know what it's, what, what it's doing and how it's doing it. And you're gonna throw darts at me, but I am I am I am done. <laughs> so unless there's any other unless there's any other questions on there, um, I, I tell you what, just to make sure we stay with it, make sure for your credit purposes, okay. So I'm giving you a homework assignment, okay. It should take about 11 minutes on your homework assignment on there. In all seriousness. I would ask you to look at the, the disk docs that I put out there. Think about how you're going to deploy it, how you deploy AI in your org. And think about, in real life, what would be your risks, OK? And so you may have secret squirrel things you're doing, OK? But walk through how would you know that the data you're putting in is good, the data coming out is good. And so give that some thought. With that, if there's no other questions or anything, you have a home assignment, they'll 